So our next talk is by Bernard von Stengel, and he's going to tell us about rank one rank by matrix scale. Well, thank you for the invitation. Uh, this is joint work with Arthur Garg, Meta, and Sohoni. Part of it was actually done while we were here two years ago, over two years ago at, in Bonn. So this is about a uh, rank one biometric scheme. And a biometric scheme is the most basic model in game theory where you have two players and they individually select an action. It's a row for the row player, a column for the column player. And then there are two matrices uh, which have the payoffs to the two players. The corresponding entry of A is given to player one, the entry of B to player two. And it's a zero sum game if the sum of the two matrices is the zero matrix. And you can generalize, so that is clearly a matrix of rank zero. If you now say that the sum of the matrices has a bounded rank, uh, then this is called a game of that rank. Um, it's better to reduce this um, constraint, the sum, than the matrices themselves, which would be way too restricted. So my co-authors found stock in 2011, uh, made the observation, and that's part of this work, that an exact Nash equilibrium of a rank one game can be found in polynomial time. And um, you know, this is coming out of this in particular. I mean, the, the second message is that, in fact, every equilibrium of such a game can be found essentially in the time that you normally need to find a single equilibrium of a general by matrix game. We will use frequently that the rank of something is k if and only if it can be written as a sum of, of k rank one matrices. And when you look at it, because that's completely symmetric in rows and columns, it's a very easy proof that row rank equals column rank, if you ever wonder how to prove that, it's straightforward. So in particular, uh, if A, B is given like this, uh, then we can write as C plus A, B transpose, so this is a rank one matrix, where A, C is a matrix of rank one minus one, and in particular, if k is equal to 1, that means a, b is written as a minus a plus a rank 1 matrix. And these are the games that we look at. And uh, because the message will be that these games can be solved very fast, uh, it should also have uh, some... The question is, how interesting are these games? And I start with a little bit of economic motivation. Any economist in this room here? Um, so... Uh, <laughs> you can say whatever you want. <laughs> So you can think of, for instance, this, I uh, think, I mean, um, say, say, player one has, um, can so decide as a seller, who can decide on the quality of whatever service maybe they provide, player two can decide on quantity, say, um, the quantities themselves, so quantity bj for column j. And now here is the interesting story, I think. The price that you would charge when you choose row i and column j can be completely arbitrary. And it's a, a zero-sum component, because that is clearly given from player two to player one. But I mean, the benefit of trade is, this is what I want to express, is a product ai times bj. So higher quality benefits both, obviously, no, benefits the, the buyer, obviously, and higher quantity the um, both in a certain sense. And the idea is that this, of course, creates a certain cost for the producer, for the seller, but a higher benefit beta for the buyer, and therefore we have here a positive term which uh, defines the benefits of trade. Trade is not a zero-sum game, in spite of what some politicians in the US think. Um, we can even think of here an additive constant gamma j for the row player or an additive constant for a quality level for the column player which doesn't affect the best responses at all. That's known if you add a constant to the payoffs of the column player to the rows, that's the same best responses that you have there. So I try to advertise this model if you know any reference or any connection. I'd be very grateful to sell this better to economists. Um, so what I will now show you, show you is that the whole method will be based on some parameterized solving of games. And I show this here for a simple 2 by 2 game where we have, say, an identity matrix for player 1 and the second matrix is 0, 0, 0, 1, which would be very easy to, to look at, plus a bonus lambda that is added to the second column. So this is a zero, I mean, constant columns multiplied times lambda. And the way you find an equilibrium of such a game, so this will be parameterized by lambda and we look at how this works. 
So if lambda is one, this we add constant one here, so that means so what 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 do this what does this figure mean? It means I plot the expected payoff. This is how you start an equilibrium computation. Because in general we need mixed equilibria, you need to randomize. So we look at the probability of playing the bottom strategy, and we plot the expected payoff to player two, the blue player, the column player, depending on which action she chooses. Either zero, zero, the left column will always be zero. So this is this constant line, or it will be lambda in the first part when she chooses the um, when player one chooses the top row, or one plus lambda when player one chooses the bottom row. So this is this line. And obviously, this is above the bottom line, so the second player would always choose right. And when you know that, then you choose the best response to the right column, which for player one is because it's either zero or one, it's clearly the bottom row. So this is actually the best response to that thing, which is this point, which is the equilibrium. Okay? So player one choosing bottom, and player two responding with right. And now this changes. This is a function of lambda. So if lambda gets lowered, it happens to be when lambda is zero, there will be actually a second best response. So we then actually have this, when lambda is zero, this matrix only. And then it turns out to be that um, top left is also an equilibrium. When you play top, which is this point here, both are best responses, but you have to play the left column in order for this to stay the best response, because otherwise they will switch. So there's a second equilibrium. And this is actually a non-generic situation. If you have a number which is slightly lower, you get actually three equilibria. This one here is determined. These are pure equilibria. This is one where you make the other player indifferent at this intersection point, and therefore the other player can mix, and there will be also a second mixed equilibrium. OK, so when you plot this, you get these equilibria pop up or out like this, and they look like this. But the story that is interesting here is these equilibria don't come out of the blue. They actually have a structure here which is less apparent than when you lower this thing, which can be plotted like this. In fact, they form a path which looks like this. And let me actually plot the corresponding strategy of player two with it, because the payoff matrix to player one is constant here, it doesn't depend on number. And they will essentially always play the same strategy, except that these transition points where there will be a whole set of equilibria, for instance, zero, zero, you can support the uh, strategy, uh, this will be the segment of uh, intervals where you play mix between left and right, where still the top um, row will be less response. So it's this thing, but the pair of points here is actually a path in the product space which de describes these equilibria. So in other words, when you parameterize the game, the equilibria don't pop out, out in random fashions, but they actually are forming one-dimensional sets. They're not necessarily paths, there could be cycles in there. But this is a well-known phenomenon. It's called the homotopy observation. And it actually has been studied uh, before. In this particular case, it's something known due to Govindan and Wilson. They do the following, pretty much what we are doing here, a little bit more general. You have constant payoffs for bonuses for the rows, which I call here C1 up to Cm, B1 up to Bn for the columns, scaled by lambda. And if you make lambda large, and assume that, say, for example, this has a unique maximum that will dominate, say, there's a unique maximum of B. For large lambda, this means that this is the best response clearly chosen by the column player. Then you choose the best response, it's the strategy J of player one. And then you know you have a pure equilibrium. And now you trace the equilibrium by lowering lambda. And when you actually implement that, you get what is called an LCP, I mean, algorithm. In fact, it's Lemke's algorithm a well-known method for non-solving linear complementarity problem. It's a sequence of segments which winds up at a solution, in this case, when lambda is zero. Lambda might not, might not change monotonically, as you've seen in the previous case. You see your lambda goes back up, depending on how you shift this. But the key point is here that you stop when lambda is zero, and this is something you will generalize. You will not stop at lambda equals to zero, but at something else. In fact, and this bonus vector only assigns a single bonus to a single strategy, a row or a column. This is what is known as the Rosen algorithm, which was actually even earlier than this. So this is well known, I mean, for games. So also the, the correspondences between equilibria is not new. And now, actually, by the way, um, the game, the rank was introduced earlier by Kahneman and Theobald. 
um, in order to prove some approximate equilibrium for these bounded um, rank gains. Uh, the algorithm is not sophisticated and not very useful because uh, it, I, I mentioned it. It's exponential actually in the rank and uh, bad in the approximation that you want to achieve as well. So here's the point that this is not an approximate thing, but it's an exact equilibrium. And we use this via a rank reduction, which I thought was very exciting when I first encountered this. And I will, this will motivate actually how, how this is done. So here are the observ the, fir the first observation is the following. It's not just for rank one games, for general rank. X, Y is Nash equilibrium of the game A, C plus A, B transposed. And now you look at a different game where you add a bonus to the column, so you add only constant uh, constants to the columns. So instead of having a rank one matrix here, you just add constants to the columns, just as I did in this in this uh, thing at the beginning. And you impose a second constraint that says now the A is actually equal to X times A is equal to nothing. So this is the second constraint. And let's prove that it's actually, I mean, I'm sure not proving public, but it's actually completely straightforward if you write the matrix products in the right way. A times, so it's completely clear that nothing changes for player one, but for player two, that if x times a is equal to lambda, then we have x, meaning the payoff to the column player, using that matrix can be split in this way because x times a is equal to lambda. Now x is a probability distribution, so x times one is one. You can take it out again, and this is this. So in other words, what you do is, in a sense, lambda is the average payoff when you multiply x times a. And that's why this works. So, and now comes the What we have done here is we added constants to the columns of the column player, which of course distorts the game because it gives these bonuses to the column player. But we can do it without penalty at all, and this is completely well known, to the row player without changing the best responses because if it's constant for a column, it will not affect how you react between your row choices, no matter what these column bonuses are. And now when you look at the sum of these two matrices, the lambdas cancel, I mean these terms cancel out because now we have that's the same as the game AC, okay? So in other words, we have reduced, we have expressed the Nash equilibrium of a game of rank one by a Nash equilibrium of a rank K minus one of k, of rank k, sorry, rank k minus 1 plus a uh, hyperplane with lambda. So that seemed to be very exciting because it would offer a rank reduction method of finding one equilibrium. And then what would be the basic trick, which actually works for rank 1 games, and I will show you shortly why it doesn't work for general rank. In the following way, you so let's observe what lambda is here. Lambda is actually x times a. Now x is a probability distribution, a is a vector of bonuses for the rows. So if we, clearly, this is a convex combination of the payoffs with these bonuses for the rows, so it must be between the smallest and largest value of A. And so we can do a binary search for lambda. We, take now, we find a solution for the smallest value, one for the largest value, then take a middle value, and find an equilibrium. And then, depending on where x times A winds up with, we can use the corresponding value of lambda to know that, I mean, there must be, one is on one side of the other prime, one is on the other, and then we do a binary search on this. So let me show you how I thought this works. So this is the description, I don't have time to go into the details, but exactly what I said. So we start with two solutions, one for a lower and one for a higher value of lambda, corresponding equilibrium solutions, we know this is in between, and depending on what we then choose for the middle part, we can then narrow down the choice of lambda. Here I've given a game which is essentially it's up to some scalar transformation, the one I showed you before. Here I added the constant 1, 1 to payoffs of player 1, otherwise it's the identity matrix. The effect will be that this is not a rank 1 game, but um, it's a AC plus a rank 1 matrix. Okay, So this is equal to, so my rank 1 matrix is 0, 1 for the columns, 1 minus 1 for the rows. And I want to solve the equation x times a is equal to lambda. So lambda is between 1 and minus 1. And so when top row you play 1, lambda is 1. This is the hyperplane that I do. There is no constraint on y. So this is the hyperplane that intersects this parameterized set of solutions. Remember, we parameterize the game by adding the bonus lambda to it. Okay, so the intersection of this zigzag line with this hyperplane gives me the unique equilibrium of the game. Why unique? 
because clearly when the payoff matrix is 0, 0, 1, 1, the right column will be played. So it's the right column bottom, bottom strategy. A single solution, which we're now trying to find. And now let's do binary search. We start with lambda is equal to 1. We get an x bar, which is this equilibrium. This is lambda is equal to 1, this one. A lambda equal to 1, a minus 1 gives me, I choose this one. There's multiple choices, could be the solution, but I choose this one, x under bar. And I say, okay, now let's do the half value, which is 0 for lambda, and I pick this one. Okay, so now I see this x, y is below the hyperplane, the x upper bar, upper bar, y upper bar is above the hyperplane. So I think that my lambda to solve the optimal solution is between 0 and 1. So I try to narrow down the search between here. And now you see I have already lost. Why? Because the real number, number value of lambda is not between 0 and 1, but minus 1. So no matter how I try search now, I will converge in lambda, but I will not converge in equilibrium. What has gone wrong? Well, what has gone wrong is the fact is that the search for lambda doesn't coincide with the search for x. And this is due to the lack of monotonicity of this path. So it does, in fact, it wouldn't have been to be true, because Ruttal showed in my quarter then that rank 3 by matrix games are PPAD hard. In fact, there is a claim, it's not even a paper, it's just a claim that says that the same proof works for rank 2. I don't know how to call this. this I mean, they just say it. They don't even give it. I don't want to be. So the initials are copy C O T Y. I mean, um, um, so now here comes the key point. This same game or a similar game can be written. Here's a zero sum game. I mean, a rank one game. So what we have here is A and B. Uh, when you sum them up, uh, they are a. Um, so C, uh, here you see A plus C is, is, is 0, it's the rank 0 game. A, C is minus 1. And then plus 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1 is um, a, a rank 1 matrix. And when I do this, I mean, you see that the path is monotone. Okay? It goes with lambda. It, goes not, it never goes down. And here's the reason. What are we doing here? In the rank 1 game, it means whenever you fix lambda, you get a 0 sum game. So when you cut across, you have the solutions to a zero-sum game. This is sometimes here a line segment, uh, or generically it's a point, but it's always a convex set because the solutions to a zero-sum game correspond to the solution of an LP, and that must be a convex set. So if I had a zigzag line here like before, that would cut across, I would get disjoint solutions, and that cannot be. So that's a very simple explanation why this thing has to be monotonic. And there is actually a thing, in, it's the x, y times b plus lambda is actually a monotonic function. So there, when you narrow down the search for lambda, you also narrow down the search on the plane. So that's where why the binary search works for rank 1 games. However, of course, the hyperplane that you have could intersect multiple times this line and create different points. So this is an example where you have multiple solutions, but the path itself I mean, is monotonic. So, um, now let's look a little bit at the details how this works. Remember that I said the Nash equilibrium of this rank 1 game, A minus A, A, B, I corresponding to the Nash equilibrium of this parameterized zero sum game together with x times A is lambda. Remember, lambda is not driven to zero. It's meant to intersect this extra linear construct. Okay? Now let's look a little bit of uh, parameterized zero sum games. And here's the absolute standard way of doing that. If you have a game where A minus A are the payoffs, you can look at the equilibrium strategy is the same as a min-max strategy. It tries to minimize the amount the column player has to pay, which means I choose a real variable u that says for each row you pay at most u, subject to the constraint that you have a probability distribution 1 times y is 1, y not negative. And in fact, the dual of this LP, when you see the dual constraints here, are exactly a probability distributions that will be a maximum strategy of the row. And I will write this LP in the following form. These constraints, uh, y is in the unit simplex, I write as y and y. So components sum up to 1 are negative. And now we have a parameterized zero-sum game, which looks like this. It means uh, you add these bonuses multiplied by lambda. In fact, you subtract them with p1 for the times lambda from the first column up to bn times lambda from the second column, from the last column, and so on. Okay. 
And now I claim this can be even more simplified. This is here you parameterize the payoffs of the LP, uh, the, the main matrix entries, but if I do the substitution that use the linear function t minus lambda times b transpose y, to put that on the right hand side, you see that this cancels and becomes ay less than or equal to 1 times t, essentially like a zero sum game where this is the payoff with this, but with a different objective. So here you have parameterized the objective function instead of the LP itself, which is obviously simple. So actually you can show, see in pictures what this means. If you subtract the constant on the right hand side, you essentially shift this set of uh, the outer envelope that you choose. I mean, less than or equal to u, you shift this u up and down. But you always minimize, so sometimes it's this, sometimes it's that segment, sometimes this point, sometimes this segment, sometimes here. So you have multiple different solutions depending on lambda. If you do the other one, you keep the x a y less than or equal to 1 times 1 fixed, which is this everything, see this means t is greater than or equal to a times y for the first row, second row, in this case only two rows. Everything above here is this polyhedron, anything here, the polyhedron stays fixed. This here, this here, this here. But you change the objective function, which in a sense wrap around this polyhedron. This is what you do when you change lambda. It says the same solution. So that's here it's repeated. Essentially, in general, the set of solutions to a parameterized LP, where you parameterize the objective function, it's the shadow vertex algorithm that you looked at earlier. So you take the polyhedron of constraints, you have the hyperplane whose direction varies only with a single parameter, and you sort of roll it around this polyhedron and you get this shadow down there, which is essentially a sequence of segments, typically vertices and edges of the polyhedron, but in general facets. I would love to have a reference that shows you the general structure of this rather than just the generic case, which was already due to Gus and Sartre in 1955. <coughs> I didn't find good books on this. Okay, so we have binary search. I don't have time to go into this, but it's essentially the thing that I showed you how it fails for the zigzag line in a monotonic line. It works perfectly. Uh, the numbers get smaller and smaller, I mean, closer and closer to each other. You know from the data that at some point you can stop. <laughs> go directly for an exact solution because we will be sitting either on a vertex or on, a, on an edge, which is the same edge for the, the same values of lambda, so in fact you can solve it exactly at that point. That's standard. It has to do with the fact that the edges cannot be, I mean the vertices cannot be arbitrarily close, given the data of the game. Okay, and the second thing is, which is also more or less straightforward, you just follow the path. You can prove that there's only a single path, and then you enumerate while you go along the path whatever you encounter whenever you cross the hyperplane. And path following normally, like in Gobind and Wilson, normally finds one equilibrium. Here, if you follow the path and take the intercepts with the hyperplane, you get all equilibrium, which is much, much better, because normally you would have to enumerate all the vertices of these polyhedra and check whether the equilibrium holds, condition holds. This is much, much faster. So, to repeat, um, uh, a um, rank one game can be solved in logarithmic number of LPs, binary search for number, from finding one equilibrium <coughs> or a path following method intercepted with a hyperplane to enumerate all equilibrium. And so one question is maybe, and this was an open question by Kanan and Theobald, maybe rank one games even have polynomially many equilibria. It's very good when you start to study complexity of equilibria. First, you look at numbers of possible solutions, which gives you a lot of. I mean, this is how I started doing the story about proving exponentially long paths for finding um, <coughs> one equilibrium. Like a house, this was an open question. So, this is the ana an, ana an analogy of a long time ago, maybe 10 years plus, uh, analogy of T minty cubes for biometric games. Paths. They started much earlier with the right polytopes that describe exponentially a <coughs> large number of equilibrium. Okay, the answer is no. Um, so the, it's, it turns out that um, an LP, a parameterized LP, can intersect the hyperplane exponentially often. This is what I want to show next. Here's an example due to a MERT um, on parameterized linear programs. It's, this is essentially a dual here. So we have the right-hand side parameterized. The right, you see the pattern. It's a lower diagonal matrix, once on the diagonal, twos below, zero above. The right-hand side is negative exponential. It's minus 1, minus 2, minus 4, minus 8. You see the pattern. The objective function similarly, 1, 4, 16, 64. If you plot the optimal solutions as a function of lambda, it's a kind of fractal situation. It's this thing reflected, zigzaggy, indeed. 
it's an exponentially long uh, path and long set of solutions. And you can use that if you do it systematically to generate things with exponentially many equilibria by just looking at the single, at the single, the least variable in here, spike them up to scale it right, and then take a hyperplane that intersects it like this. This will give you nine equilibria in a four by four game, in general, two to the n minus one plus one. And then by staring at Murphy long enough, I realized you can do even better, almost twice as much. By doing, so for a 4 by game, 4 by 4 game, it would not be 9, it would be 15. 2 to the n minus 1, many equilibria with this following observation, similar to Murphy. You have zeros below the, equi uh, the, the, equi uh, the, 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 the diagonal powers, essentially p to the, so you have a single number, not a prime, what's the number? bigger than 2, say 4, uh, p to the i plus j is the entry times 2 above the diagonal times 1 on the diagonal. Okay? So this is an, a, a matrix with exponential entries, obviously. But you take b transpose as a, so it's a symmetric game, and when you add them up, you obviously get 2 times p to the i plus j in each entry, and that's a, a rank 1 matrix. Okay? So a and b are both p this powers of p times 2. And I claim any subset of rows has the same set of columns as the best response. And so this defines, when you play it correspondingly in the right way, you get an equilibrium. How do you do it? Let's look at the example of playing all strategies. What you have to do is you have, if that is meant to be an equilibrium, you have to play the rows in such a, or say the columns, it's symmetric, play the columns in such a way that each row gets equal pay. Now, how do you solve that? Well, the bottom row is easy. You take right column times a constant, say the constant is equal to 1, solve this. You give go above, and then you have this twice this a little, I mean, and then another entry here. And because p is bigger than 2, it turns out that there will be a positive number for solving the second equation. <coughs> Same constant. You go all the way up, and then you just have to rescale such that the things are probabilities rather than just positive numbers. And that's your equilibrium. And exactly this method can be done by omitting some rows, meaning for any subset, and create exactly the same thing. So we have 2 to the n, any non-empty subset defines the support. We have the same subset on the other side of a Nash equilibrium, that's 2 to the n minus 1, exponentially many Nash What I would be interested in, and I have not been able to solve this exactly from the authority, because the, the way you scale and so on is tricky, because I want to enhance the understanding of this. Why? Because here's the question. If you have exponentially many equilibria, you could say, well, obviously you cannot find all of them in point of time. Because there are exponentially many of them, but maybe you can solve them in output. So maybe you need a constant type of output, that, but that would imply, and I don't think that this is not possible, so this would be output efficiency, that you can compute all equilibria in size of input and output. But that you need because you have exponentially output. Because it would be implying that you can decide uniqueness in polynomial time, meaning that's in coin P, you can easily show that there's a second equilibrium. Because if you have only one as output and you have polynomial running time, that would mean you can decide this in polynomial time. We think this is NP complete. We still work on it, but I think these exponentially many solutions of this other game can be probably used to, to encode the sub problem or something. Why? Because the binary search, when you do it, you only know when you're on, you're on one side of the hyperplane, there must be something in between, but you have no idea whether there are other intersections of the hyperplane. So that binary search doesn't give you information about that feature, more than one. And I think this is very interesting because people thought, I mean, in the beginning when they talked about complexity, I didn't say what PPAD is, but I mean, probably you invented this concept, in terms of NP and co-NP. And actually, there were many examples where you could show that some property of the game, a decision problem, which is not automatically fulfilled, is an NP hard, like uniqueness, that's known. Um, and they thought, this is the reason why games are hard to solve. But this would be an example where you can find one at Nash equilibrium in polynomial time, which is the main object of the PPAD story. But the uniqueness issue is NP hard. So there is this dichotomy between NP hardness and unique and PPAD hardness, which would then we split up with the rank property, so I think that's why this is very interesting. And you see zero-sum games are rank zero, rank one, are exactly on this borderline, and then we get the PPAD hardness. So I think it's a very good um, element of that class. It doesn't contradict the um, 
approximation story that you Just to clarify, do you think the conjecture? Uh, this is still a conjecture. Yeah, we are working on that. And rank two, I mean, <laughs> that's what I said earlier, is an announcement. Rank three is not. And so this is my last slide. That can be solved really fast. If that is the case, maybe we can solve it for big whatever Netflix problems or whatever because the prices are and we can play with them. But there is maybe I mean a nice economic interpretation which I try to offer. Some games like for no games here is an example which doesn't need an algorithm that has an explicit solution. But I think they do come up in economics and I think that's an interesting additional question. So thank you. So in particular, I would know, I mean, if you know about parameterized APs, a statement that says, I mean, they parameterize that you get the path, which is not just the sequence of vertices and edges, but maybe of faces of law that is connected would be a great reference so I don't have to prove it. It's not hard to prove, but I think it's not. Yeah. By really fast, what do you, I mean, you show it's one and right? You solve a logarithmic number. Logarithmic number, okay. But you want, if each of these LPs can be... Well, the LP is, I mean, that's it's the dimension, that's the, the complexity. I mean, if the game is 20,000 by 20,000, that's not a big LP, but it's a huge game. So really fast is empirically. Sorry? The, the open problem, I mean, that's hard as also the LPs, right? So it means, I mean, I mean, both are fast, in a sense, relative to what you want to achieve. I mean, finding one is fast and enumerating them all. Of course, that's not fast if you have an exponential output. But we think, I mean, it's really um, way out of the lead compared to what, you, what normal games are like. I mean, so rec one games are really a good class when you have a big problem. If your game falls in this class, we have exact algorithms. I mean, it's not an exact statement.